Among the many complex issues that apply to the question of Holocaust art is when the Holocaust, you might say, begins and ends. Do we start talking about it in 1933 when Hitler comes to power? in the next year or two after that, where Nuremberg laws begin to severely constrict what Jews are allowed to be and do? Do we see it really starting to take shape in November 9th, 10th, 1938 with Kristallnacht, after which, paradoxically, it was safer for Jews on the streets of Germany than it had been before because Nazi methodology and thinking had changed, no more of this street hooliganism, but they were planning a more systematic extermination that was gradually being developed from that point on. Do we see a beginning point with the beginning of World War II in 1939, by which time Germany had started to swallow up some of its near neighbors and the laws that applied to Jews in Germany proper began to apply to Jews elsewhere? Or do we see the Holocaust beginning when that systematic plan of destruction is really starting to kick in by about 1941? And when the war is over in 1945, and technically speaking, therefore so is the Holocaust, is it over? Primo Levi, in his last work, The Drowned and the Saved, talked about the idea that the word, or the phrase rather, Holocaust survivor is a kind of misnomer because nobody really survives it. It hangs on to you, its hands are around your throat for years and decades after it's over. So embedded within this question, which can be answered then from a number of different angles, we might ask about Holocaust art. Where exactly does it apply chronologically? And we realize that we can speak about Holocaust art using that phrase as art that is done during the time of the Holocaust, but we can also obviously speak about it as art that is done after the Holocaust by survivors, by their family members, by Jewish artists in general, by German and Austrian artists who are responding to it in the aftermath. For our purposes today, we'll only be talking about work done during the Holocaust, and we can leave that post-Holocaust question with respect to art for a different time and a different place. But with respect to that art itself, are we describing and discussing it in pure art historical aesthetic terms, you know, good art, bad art, that sort of thing? Or are we talking about it as a form of intense and necessary record keeping, of witnessing the events that took place? Or are we talking about it as an instrument, not of art making, but of survival in different ways? One of the things one recognizes is whatever terms or categories we use, they won't apply to everything or everyone because no two experiences of the Holocaust are identical. Another point, by the way, that Primo Levi made in his same work, Drowned and the Saved. So no two approaches to visual expression will be the same and no style, no symbol, no language visually will be the same if we look to more than one, to two, to three, to four, to five different people. Well, an appropriate starting point for looking at imagery would be with children. After all, as much as the Nazis had a plan for Jewish adults, which would, in effect, destroy our present and our past, and Jewish buildings and Jewish monuments and Jewish possessions, again, a function of present and past, the will and the thirst and the lust to destroy Jewish children was much more about the future. So it's interesting and instructive to consider first a handful of children artists, such as, for example, Nelly Toll, born in Lvov in 1935, who at the age of eight was hidden with her mother by Christian friends while her father and younger brother went elsewhere hoping that they would meet up when it was all together together. This was late 1943. As I said, she was eight years old. And her mother, to keep her eight-year-old hyperactive daughter occupied, prevailed upon their hostess, who was risking already to hide them, to go out and purchase painting materials for her daughter. So in addition to the books that were brought in by their friend Olga, that her mother would then read to or translate into child's terms, like Dostoevsky, into child's terms, for her daughter, for Nelly, she had these art supplies and she began to make beautiful works of art. In the course of the 13 months or so, while she was in hiding, she made several dozens, perhaps even as much as a couple of hundred, of these beautiful paintings and drawings, watercolors. So one looks, for example, 
at an image that she did of two women walking kind of in a field with trees behind them, beautiful, colorful dresses, one carrying a sun umbrella, the other carrying a basket with perhaps fruit or flowers. The point is, this is hardly the image you might suppose of someone who is in forced hiding, in forced incarceration, and is a reflection of the kind of vitality and resilience that children can have even under dire circumstances. And as she would later tell it, because Nellie Toll lived she survived, her mother and she both survived. She died in 2021 at the age of 88. Her father and brother did not survive. She would say it was my mother. My mother kept telling me stories. My mother encouraged me to paint. My mother was my doctor when I was sick. So she produced works like that one or a second one that I'm showing you, which shows a young boy and a young girl in a field that is filled with flowers with a nice little house behind them. Once again, uh, her work reflects um, an amazing positive perspective when one considers the difficult conditions under which she found herself. Conditions would be even more difficult, not surprising, for children who found themselves incarcerated in the Camp Teracin, as it was called in Czech, it's not far from Prague, Czechoslovakia, or Theresienstadt, as the Germans called it, the lobby of hell as it's known, into which between about 1941 and 44, some 150,000 Jews, among them some 15,000 children under the age of 15 were brought in, of whom as far as we know, only 100 children survived, maybe more, but not that much more, if there were more indeed. And Teresin, by irony, had been a, a military encampment, a military fortress really, near a town that had been built back in the late 18th century by the Habsburg Emperor Joseph II, who had liberated, emancipated the Jews in the 1780s, ahead of the curve, even ahead of the French Revolution, and built it in honor of his mother. That's why it's called Theresienstadt or Terezin, because she was Maria Theresa. She hated Jews. So an interesting kind of tension between their respective views and the place that ended up being this place to which Jews from all over the area were brought, usually for a period of time from one to three years, and then off they would go to Auschwitz. So among the people who ended up there was a woman by the name of Friedel Dicker Brandeis, who herself had been an artist and an art teacher, and who when she was transported to Theresienstadt, instead of bringing suitcases filled with clothes and things, she brought art supplies because she was already anticipating how she could help children to survive the trauma of that camp by introducing them to art making. And when she was transported to Auschwitz, she left behind two suitcases that she buried filled with somewhere between 4,500 and 5,000 paintings and drawings made by children. And she typically insisted that they sign them so they would be remembered. We'd know their names, we'd know their dates, we'd know their ages. The stuff that she herself did, she left unsigned. So one looks, for example, at this wonderful image of fireflies. Again, a kind of pair of figures, but this is entirely out of the imagination of a child who, in spite of what I just said, is anonymous. So this is unsigned. We don't know who this child is. We don't know who, who made this wonderful little painting of butterflies that um, one might associate with among the more famous works of poetry that were created by children at Teretzin during the same time period. The Butterfly by Pavel Friedman, his name we have, and this was in uh, 1942, he wrote, the last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow, perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone, and it goes on, but the last stanza says, that butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here in the ghetto. And interestingly, there are any number of these paintings that show us butterflies as this one does, or this a house in Theresen, a kind of idealized image of what the child remembers and hopes to reclaim a kind of dream for the future that defies the reality of what the present and potential future is likely to be. Now, as I said, all these three are anonymous, but not everything that we find is anonymous, given what um, uh, Friedel Dicker Brandeis insisted for the most part, which is that kids sign their work, so at least we know of some of them. So this wonderful garden, it's actually, as you can see, people who are uh, airing out mattresses in the garden. And we know who did it 
because it's signed at the bottom. So we have uh, Irina Karplusova, and we also know that she died because we have her name, specifically in 1944, transported to Auschwitz, and that's where she perished. Well, Teretzin is the most famous of the places where the arts flourished, both with children and adults, both with poetry and visual arts, with visual arts and music, in part because the Nazis permitted it, because it was a means of keeping their victims calm, and because it was a means of propagandizing to the outside world that they weren't doing what they were actually doing. But there were other places as well, odd places you wouldn't expect. So the image that I'm showing you right now is an image by Ella Lieberman. She was 16 years old at the time, and it's called The Transport. It was done at Auschwitz in secret because she who was born in 1927, so do the math, she's, this is 1943, from Berlin, her father was German, her mother Polish, both Jewish. When the Germans came into Poland, any German Jews had to, excuse me, any Polish Jews had to leave Germany and go to Poland. So that's why her family went to her mother's town, Bejin, where they were incarcerated in the ghetto, and eventually, of course, they were sent to Auschwitz. But there was an SS officer at Auschwitz who saw that she did art. I don't know how. No one knows how, but he saw it, and the, he liked it. So he agreed if she would do drawings and paintings of different things that he chose, individuals. He wanted initially to have a, a painting of his girlfriend done from a photograph, that sort of thing, that he would protect her. He'd provide her with food. He'd provide her, and as it turns out, her mother with enough to survive. So in fact, Ella Lieberman survived. She died only in 1998. But this is not an image that she did at the behest of the SS officer, as you can imagine. This is something she was doing to record what was going on behind the backs of the SS, and it's called the transport. And you can see the uh, uh, officers crowding people into the carriages of the freight cars that, of course, are heading to Auschwitz. You'll also notice, by the way, she signed it in Hebrew, as it were, it anticipates the fact that she will, surviving the war, end up in the state of Israel, where, as I said, she would live until her death in 1998. There are a number of artists like that. Dina Gottliebova Babbitt, for example, did drawings at Auschwitz at the behest of Mengele because he felt that the photographs of his victims didn't sufficiently show their emotions. So he asked her to do some drawings of these victims, which a handful of which have survived. And that's a whole nother story for another day. But Teretzin, as I said a moment ago, was also a place where adults practiced visual art as well as other art forms. Among them, for example, Lev Haas, born in 1901. He's another one who actually survived Teretzin because he did, died in 1983. He was um, uh, initially arrested, by the way, in 1939 because he was a member of the Communist Party. Not because he was a Jew, because he was a member of the Communist Party. Only later on, the fact that he was a Jew led to the transport to Theresienstadt uh, in 1942. And uh, eventually, he would actually go to a series of different camps, uh, to Auschwitz, then to Sachsenhausen, then to Mauthausen, then to another camp, and another camp. He was finally liberated. He survived all of that. The image that you've got before you is called the transport arrival. And again, it dates from 1942, the period while he was in Theresienstadt. And you can see this incredibly long line of people from the upper left at the horizon that become more and more clear as we move through the left toward the center and across the exact center of the, of the image, we see bigger and bigger these people who are here being accompanied and led by SS officers and then the road that they have not yet gotten to the end of, continues down toward the foreground and the bottom part of the uh, painting. And you can see that in the midst of this snowy kind of bleak landscape with trees without leaves, you come to a fragment of wall. And if you look carefully, you'll see the letter V there, which was the symbol of the Theresienstadt underground. So there are a number of artists who would put Vs in their images to show that they were supporting or were part of the resistance. Haas, as I said, survived. And one of the things that he and his wife did 
shortly after the war was to adopt the three-year-old son of Biedrich Fritta, who did not survive. He also went back to Theresienstadt and was able to locate something like 400 of his works that he buried before he was transported to Auschwitz, and 200 of those by Biedrich Fritta that had also been buried before he went to Auschwitz, but Fritta did not survive. Born in 1906, he would be brought to Terezin on the second transport in 1941, one of the first groups to come there. And by 1944, he was sent to Auschwitz. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, after the war, some 200 of, of his works were found by his friend and colleague Lev Haas, who also adopted his son. So we're looking here at a Fritta work, which is called Rear Entrance. We don't have a precise date between 1941 when he arrived and 1944 when he departed, as it were. <laughs> And take note of one feature in particular, which is this rear entrance has a gate that is partially open, and it's intended to be a metaphor for death. So there's only one way out. It's through that gate, and that gate is death. Another of his works is called Film and Reality, same time period, 1941 to 44, and it really plays twice on the idea of film and reality. So on the one hand, you see that the camera itself is the cameraman and the cameraman is the camera and the makeup woman is the table on whose lap all the makeup stands and of course she's got a six-pointed star on her chest so we realize the line has been completely blurred between the figures who are in action and the objects that are part of the action which reflects on the notion that after all all of these figures who are Jews are as far as the Nazis are concerned objects and not people. So that's one way in which he's playing on the question of imagination and illusion and reality. The more profound way, in a sense, is the makeup girl is kind of putting a crayon, you know, on the eyebrow of the old man who's sitting there with his walking stick, and there's a curtain behind him, and that's what the camera in full blast of light is showing the viewer, who would not be where we're standing, of course, but off to our right looking from where the camera is, and the viewer is seeing this old man who looks you know, reasonably healthy. He's just an old man. But of course, behind the curtain, what you and I can see that the camera isn't capturing, that the viewer behind the camera is not intended to see, is this skeletal figure collapsed by that thick wall with a barbed wire over it, because ultimately the point and purpose of Teretzin is not for you to have a good time. It's for you either to perish gradually because of exhaustion and disease and whatever else, or to ultimately be transported to Auschwitz where you will perish. And these are the ideas that are being recorded and witnessed here, not so that the Nazis can see them, but so that they can be hidden away and saved for you and me to see them at some point thereafter. Now, interestingly, with the grown-ups as with the children, not everything is black and white. So we have a beautiful watercolor by Moritz Müller, who also perished the same year, 1944, as did Biedrich Fritta. He was a little bit older, born in 1887. And uh, he actually had run a successful auction house in Germany, which of course was closed down, and it was closed down, and then he was pressed into surface, I love the irony of it, appraising the value of the artworks that the Nazis were plundering from Jews primarily and from others as well in what it developed as a very systematic manner. But ultimately, in the end, of course, instead of doing that, he was sent to Terezin. And one of the last works he apparently did before he was deported to Auschwitz is this work called Rooftops in Winter. And again, it's from 1944. The snow kind of functions as a metaphor. We're seeing only rooftops. It's kind of pretty, isn't it? The blues in the sky and the blues reflecting off the snow and the kind of dialogue between the clouds and the natural forms on the one hand and the geometries of the human-made buildings on the other. And even that nice whip, wh wisp of smoke dead center rising uh, from that chimney, except what it's hiding beneath it, what's beneath the snow, what's within the buildings of whom we're only seeing the rooftops, is ugliness with a capital U. So the beauty hides the ugliness within it, and um, the, the snow therefore becomes a metaphor for that which is hidden, simply enough. He was only in Teretzin for a year, and he did 
over 500 works. So he was clearly crazy to get all this down. And again, his stuff was hidden. Again, it was found afterwards and, of course, has survived. One more Terrotson image, which is particularly unusual, by Pavel Fantel um, from Prague, born there in 1903, came to Terrotson probably around 1943, and in any case, uh, made his way to Auschwitz, not willingly, of course, where he perished by 1945. But this painting that he managed to do somehow and managed to hide away, it was hidden in a wall by a Czech worker, is called The Song is Over, and it's done sometime between 1944, 1942 and 1944. And you can see it's Hitler as a clown, a street clown, in the night with this street lamp, however, harshly showing him to us. And we can see that not only does he look confused, but the musical instrument with which he has been seducing millions of people to do his will, has fallen to the ground, it's broken. The strings of the guitar are torn away. There's blood around it and there's blood on his hands. It's a rather startling and startlingly bravely negative image of the ultimate destroyer by one of those who ultimately he destroyed. There were other places besides Terezin, to repeat, where art somehow managed to be made the exceptional circumstances of Auschwitz where I began with a child artist and moving on to one of the more famous camps in the south of France toward the Spanish border was the, the camp of Gurs, G-U-R-S. And you can see in the background of this image the mountains. Those, of course, are the Pyrenees that separate um, France from Spain. And what's interesting about this painting is it's part of a group of works that were done by two artists together. So Karl Bodek and Kurt Konrad Löw were the two who collaborated on this painting, which is called One Spring, and it was done in 1941. And you can see, aside from the backdrop with those beautiful snow-covered mountains, in the middle ground, hazy, you realize you're seeing a transport there. And then a little bit closer, these rather anonymous but very dark buildings. And then in the immediate foreground, two lengths of wire that are obviously uh, the uh, barbed wire fence and hovering on one of its little sprockets is this beautiful, beautiful yellow butterfly. And again, one might think of Pavel Friedman's poem, that butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here in the ghetto. Well, this is not the ghetto, it's the camp of Gurs. What's interesting and what's both sad and happy, sad on the one hand is that Karl Biddick um, was sent to Auschwitz the next year in 1942. He had been from um, Bukovina and had fled to France and to Belgium when the Nazis came in and ultimately he was arrested in Belgium and then sent to Gur and ultimately from there he was sent to Auschwitz and that's where he perished. Whereas on the other hand, uh, Kurt Konrad Löw, who was from Vienna, who also fled to Belgium about 1939, um, ended up also in Gur, but he managed, as he was being transported from Gur, presumably to Auschwitz, to get off the train in Bordeaux, and the International Red Cross enabled him to flee to Switzerland, to Geneva, and um, that's where he stayed. He was safe during the war, and ultimately, by the aftermath of the war in 1952, he moved back to Vienna. So the point from which he had come is the point to which he returned, and that's where he died in 1980. Remarkable that he felt the desire, ultimately, to end up in Vienna, all things considered. So all of the artists whose work I've shown you up to this point are artists whose work was made in various camps, with the exception of Nellie Toll, where I began, her art was made in hiding. But that notion of somehow, somewhere, making art during the, the time of these atrocities uh, carries us to other figures outside these walls of concentration camps, of extermination camps, of hidden attics and the like. So Charlotta Solomon, uh, was very renowned for the work that she did. She was born in 1917 in Berlin, and she grew up in a Berlin in which she lived a very 
secularized Jewish life. I call her a Christmas Jew. She had Christmas trees. She celebrated the Christian holidays. She and her family felt themselves pretty much part of the German world rather than per se part of the Jewish world. There was one thing about her family which was particularly unique and uniquely disturbing. Her aunt, who was named Charlotta, in fact, she was named for that aunt, one day got up, walked 21 miles to a lake and threw herself in and drowned. Her mother, at a later point, when Charlotta was still a young girl, jumped from the window and committed suicide. So her mother and her aunt are suicides. Her father marries a woman named Paulina, who, with whom Charlotte had a very close relationship, not your wicked stepmother by any means, someone who really doted on her. And ultimately, at one point, her father was um, arrested, and in, for six months he was in Sachsenhausen, but because of their connections, they were able to get him out. And at that point, her father, who, by the way, was a prominent physician, he's the father of mammography. He was the first to recognize the use of x-ray to detect cancer in the breast. He and his uh, new wife decided that it would be safer for Charlotte to go to the south of France. And there, there was a, a wonderful estate that was owned and lived in by a, an American millionaires by the name of Ottilie Moore. And she had already granted um, a refuge to the maternal grandparents of Charlotta. So her father said, yeah, this is where we should send her. And Attilia Moore was a rescuer and a giver of refuge, particularly to pregnant women and a protector of babies. Um, so that when under the Vichy re regime, it, become le it became less and less safe, even on that estate. She left taking something like eight different babies with her to try and save them and protect them. And Charlotta chose to stay behind. Meanwhile, as the time gets later and the situation more dire, her grandmother fails to and then succeeds in committing suicide, jumping from a third story window. Do I hear a motif here? Her aunt, her mother, her grandmother. That leaves her and her grandfather, who were arrested in 1940 and sent to Gur for several months. It's not clear why they got out, but they come back to the farm, and only recently, in 2011, did some of what Charlotta had written in her diary as a kind of confession, actually as a letter, not a diary really, a letter to um, her lover, Alfred Wolfson, admitting that she had poisoned her grandfather. And then it turns out he had sexually abused her when they were in Gur and on the train to Gur. I mean, it sounds like an extraordinary story, so her suffering was fairly intense from a, a number of different directions. But by then, she had been convinced by Wolfson that maybe it would be a good idea for her to um, make art in order to help her deal with the complexities of her emotional situation. So to make a long story short, Charlotta produces something like 1,293 gouaches, of which she chooses 769, together with 32,000 words of texts, and puts the whole thing together in a compendium that she calls life or theater. So in the first pair of images that I'm showing to you, on the one hand, we see a youngish Charlotta still in high school, yearning for love. Those are the little hearts that we see there. And on the other image, we see her at a later point when she's in the south of France, because most of the text is in German, but you'll notice that the texts here are in French. And most of the early work, because it's recording her whole life, shows the kind of very comfortable life in Berlin in this 11-room apartment and so on and so forth, where she lived with her father and stepmother until things gradually collapsed. And the first sign of that collapse is the next image I'm showing you, where the text reads, and things changed, right? It's the 30th of January, 1933, and you can see these are the Nazis marching, led by the swastika, filling the streets, and that's when everything began, became very, very different and very, very difficult. So through the course of the life story that is told by this work, we arrive at the end, the very last image, number 769, is this one. 
and you can see it's Charlotta herself kneeling on the, uh, the, of the, on the sand by the sea, and she's drawing, and on her back it's written Leben oder Theater, Life or Theater. You may also notice that there's a kind of red series of marks leading from her eye to the right-hand corner of the painting, and there we have a white blank area, but if you look carefully, to the left of it, there looks like there is the profile of a girl surging up from the sea, kind of like Aphrodite rising from the sea. Is it Aphrodite? Is it love? Is it Charlotta's aunt for whom she was named rising from the sea after having committed suicide? Is it Charlotta herself, a kind of self-portrait who will rise from the sea, her work and her life being discovered many decades after her death? One of the interesting things about Charlotte Solomon's work is, needless to say, it is typically presented as Holocaust art because of the circumstances and the conditions in which she depicted what she depicted, and much of it obviously does pertain to the events of the Holocaust as they apply to herself. But really, when one looks at the sweep of this extraordinary, obsessive range of works, it's about her, herself, it's about her family, her sense of doom, not because of the Holocaust, but, be, but because she has a whole legacy of women in her family committing suicide, and the question is, will I be next? It's about love, the love that she feels for um, Alfred Wolfson early on, who becomes in her narrative, Daberlon, she gives him a different name, a kind of a music teacher. It's about creativity, and of course it's about death. It's about Nietzsche, it's about Goethe, all that stuff is in there. It's about Michelangelo, it's about Beethoven. So her work is much broader than merely about the subject of the Holocaust, but the context in which it is formed is the context of the Holocaust and her particular experience of it. When um, Ottilie Moore left and took those babies with her, and at that point um, Charlotte and her grandfather were still around and then he'd be deported to Gour and then they would come back and then she would poison him so she was alone. Moore had left um, Alexander Nutzler in, in charge of the farm, of the estate, and he and Charlotte ended up getting married. Not a wise thing to do because if you do it officially at the city hall, now the city hall knows who you are and where you are, and when they come looking for you, they know where to look. The long and the short of which is that she was uh, she answered the door to the Gestapo a second time, as it were, on September 23, 1943, when she was deported to Auschwitz. He insisted on coming with her, and she was five months pregnant, and it wasn't too long thereafter that she perished at Auschwitz. And we see this last image of her self-portrayed, this wonderful self-portrait with those piercing eyes staring you and me in the face as if to say, so what do you think? What are you going to do about it? Another artist who was professionally trained and very skilled, who followed a, a kind of similar path really to that of Charlotte Solomon, is Felix Nussbaum from Osnabrück in Germany, where um, in 1939, so when the war broke out, he left Germany and he went to Belgium where he hoped he would be safe. And uh, he was for about a year, but they caught up with him, the Gestapo, in 1940. He was sent to Saint Cyprien in the south of France, um, not far from where the Camp uh, Gur is, and he managed somehow to escape and make his way back up to Belgium and to his wife, um, Felte Platek, and for the next three years or so they lived in hiding, dependent entirely on a very close small group of friends who would bring them food, bring them stuff to drink, bring them whatever they needed, including, in his case, painting equipment, because he continued to paint while in hiding during this whole time, until uh, at a certain point in uh, June 20th, 21st, the night of the 20th, 21st, 1944, two days after he'd finished his last great painting, um, the Gestapo was there, they were arrested, they were sent to Auschwitz, and uh, ultimately, of course, both of them perished very quickly after arrival. So what I've chosen among the many works that I could have chosen to show you from Nussbaum 
begins with this self-portrait done in 1943. So this is while they're in hiding, you understand. But if there is a look of perhaps uh, consternation on his face, I would say it's also just a work of concentration because he's not only looking out at you and me, he's actually looking in the mirror in order to portray himself. So we stand where the mirror is. And we see him naked from the waist up. You know, we see him with a pipe. We see him, I think, rather confidently self-portrayed, very comfortable in who and what he is as an artist, regardless of what's going on in the world around him. And among the details that I think are particularly skilled, if you look at the um, palette that he's holding, the way the, the used and not used uh, scrubs of paint are there is particularly wonderful. And I love, on the other hand, in the background, the way he is he has a light focused on him so that his shadow is on the wall behind him. In the same year, compare that to this self-portrait where we see him as if he has been cornered by the Gestapo in some corner in the middle of town and you can see the walls to either side. There's, there's nowhere to go. He's showing his identity card. It's got the word Jew in French and in Flemish so we understand that this is taking place in Belgium, in uh, Brussels, actually. He's got the star under his collar. He's showing that the star is there. Beyond the wall, we see this truncated tree. And at the same time, we see a slightly flourishing florid tree and a bit of barbed wire and a, and a building. But the main thing is look at the expression on his face. It has changed from one painting to the next, and it's in the same year. This has fear in the eyes. This has terror in the eyes. If we look at one more of Nussbaum's, and I'm deliberately turning the clock back, because this is a painting from 1939, so four years before these, this was done either when he was still in Osnabrück or shortly after he had arrived in Belgium for the first time, you know, before he was taken to San Cyprian and then managed to return to Belgium. And uh, it's called The Refugee. And you can recognize this simply enough as a kind of metaphor. It's a, it's a statement of the isolated German Jew. Where in the world can I go? We've got this hunched over character in an empty cell that looks very much like a kind of jail cell with this long table. And on it, of course, is a globe, a map of Europe and Africa. Where can one go? Where can I take refuge? I came from Germany to Belgium. I ended up in a camp in France, I came back to Belgium. He ends up being betrayed because by then the Nazis had tried a new methodology with respect to rounding people up. They were offering rewards. Turn in a Jew will give you X amount of marks, francs, dollars, whatever the denomination was. And that seems to, what have, seems to be what had happened to him. I call your attention to two other features in this work. One, Obviously, of course, near the figure himself, we see the walking stick and we see that pack, that backpack, that satchel with his belongings on the floor. I'm going to come back to that in a few moments. And through the archway, we see these trees without branches, a kind of bleak landscape, and you may see a flock of their ravens, these ravens who symbolize night they symbolize the void. They can even symbolize the earth itself. The raven has a wide range of symbolic meanings, and some of them can be positive. Wisdom, for example, in the Norse mythology, but also this kind of negative night void, empty earth, which it seems to me is its intention here as our eye moves from the globe toward those, um, toward those ravens. So both Nussbaum and Solomon, who end up perishing in Auschwitz, the one because she has a small chance to leave the south of France and she doesn't. By the way, she brings all of her drawings to her physician and says, keep these, don't lose them, as if she knows she's going to be taken away and shortly thereafter she is. And Nussbaum, who was betrayed, we're not sure by whom, one of the people who knew where he and his wife were, they perish because they get sent to Auschwitz we can turn this whole question of Holocaust experience begetting Holocaust art in two further directions. One of them is by looking at the fragments of a once completely wall-filling series of wall paintings or frescoes done by Bruno Schulz, 
who uh, was better known as a writer and as a critic, but also as uh, an artist. In fact, uh, his first two volumes of writings were illustrated by his own work. He came from Drohobycz, Poland, and um, he was so highly regarded uh, in Poland as a stylist in language that he was awarded in 1938, consider the year, the Polish Golden Laurel Award. It's kind of the equivalent of what in the United States would be the Pulitzer Prize. I mean, it was a significant kind of very prestigious award. His town would shortly thereafter fall under Soviet control in 1939. Two years later, Operation Barbarossa, the Germans come in in 1941, and one might suppose and expect that his life would become impossible or it might end right at that point, except there was an SS officer by the name of Felix or Felix Landau who really admired his work. And in exchange for his agreeing, for Schultz's agreeing to paint up Landau's children's nursery with all of these phantasmagorical images from fairy tales, from Grimm's fairy tales and other such tales, he protected him. He could only protect him up to a point because Schultz had permission because he was under Landau's protection to go f between the ghetto and the officer's house. And one day he is doing just that. So he's passing through the Aryan area, carrying a loaf of bread with, that he had gone to get. And he gets shot by a different SS officer, Karl Günther, who apparently shot him because Landau had shot his, Günther's, favorite Jew. It's like each of them could have a pet Jew. And so since Landau had apparently shot Günther's Jew, Günther shot Landau's Jew, and that Jew happened to be Bruno Schultz. So that's how his life is ended in 1942 at the age of 50. And what's interesting about these images, two things. One, if you look at this detail, you get a sense that not everything that he depicted on these walls is just beautiful, child-delighting fairy tales. Grimm's fairy tales can be pretty grim, and he was perfectly happy to cast a kind of grim eye, given the situation that shouldn't be so surprising, even under these circumstances which are relatively comfortable for him. The second thing is that after his death, sometime thereafter, the walls were just plastered over, and this stuff was uncovered. Uh, in the early part of the new millennium. And uh, a campaign began of struggle between Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel, and the community of Drohobich that of course wanted to keep this stuff and create a kind of Bruno Schultz Museum from them. And therefore the question of who legally owns it, who morally should have it, who can more effectively take care of it, where will it be so that more people get to see it? These kinds of uh, issues uh, revolved around this series of artworks that reminds us that in the world of art, and particularly what we might call Holocaust art, there are all kinds of issues aside from the mere aesthetic question of art that attends our discussion. Let me turn this screw one last twist by showing you the image from 1938 by Mark Chagall, a very famous one. It's in the Art Institute of Chicago called White Crucifixion. We would ask, okay, is this a Holocaust image? Well, Chagall painted it in the context of Kristallnacht, the night of November 9th, 10th, when so many Jews in Germany and their homes and their shops and their synagogues were damaged or destroyed. And while Chagall himself, who had fled Tsarist Russia, come back at the time of the revolution, was put in charge in the immediate aftermath of the revolution of uh, the arts in Vitebsk, the town from which he had come, actually, in Belarus, and ultimately left again and uh, had studios in Berlin as well as in Paris. When World War II came around, obviously, uh, as a Jewish artist, there weren't a lot of places he could be safe. And if for a while he was in the south of France, he was one of those artists who managed to make it to the United States where he felt very much a kind of fish out of water. But before that, in 1938, he does this painting. He takes the most Christian of Christian images, the crucified Christ, 
and he transforms him into a suffering Jew. His loincloth looks very much like a talit, a Jewish prayer shawl. Hovering over him are not the kind of angels you would find in a crucifixion, let's say by Giotto or Cimabue or one of the Renaissance artists, but Jewish elders hovering in horror around him. And to our right, we see a synagogue which is on fire. We can see a brown shirt rushing in, probably, to help destroy whatever there is in that place. To our left, we see the imagery that reflects Chagall's recollections of events between 1917 and 1921, the civil war in the nascent Soviet Union, between Mensheviks and Bolsheviks, between whites and reds, in which Jews were habitually caught in the crossfire, each group saying of the Jews they're siding with the other group. So here you see these guys charging forth with red flags. We, saw, we see all of these houses turning upside down and right side up. To the bottom of the image, we see to our left a figure running off with a Torah scroll in his arms as if to protect it. Someone else further moving off the canvas and that placard on his chest. By x-ray, we know originally Chagall had written Yudah, Jew, on it. For whatever reason, he ended up whiting it out. On the other side, we see a guy running off with a pack on his back. Remember the pack in Nussbaum's painting of the um, refugee? I said I'd come back to it. In the Yiddish language, which was Chagall's first language, to have a peckle or a sekel on your back is to have a whole world of troubles. And we see this image in a number of his works that is to suggest the problem of being a Jew in the world. The other ish images to which I call your attention within this image are one, that kind of boat to our left, which seems to be a kind of refugee boat trying to carry survivors or those who want to survive to Eretz Yisrael, to Palestine. To the center, below the feet of the Christ, is that most familiar of Jewish symbols in art history, the seven-branched menorah, except look carefully, there are not seven candles. The seventh is missing, that which symbolizes the Sabbath, that which symbolizes rest, that which symbolizes salvation, that which symbolizes all of the positives that are associated within the Jewish tradition by way of the number seven, by way of the menorah and its association with the temple and its association with the Sabbath, it's not there. We only have six. And to the lower right, you recognize a Torah scroll and a white flame emerging from it, not consuming the scroll, but rising all the way to the foot of the ladder that is pressed up against the figure of the crucified Christ. In standard issue Christian art, that ladder wouldn't be empty. It would be up there because Joseph of Arimathea and or Nicodemus would be on it, lovingly taking the body of Jesus from the cross to lay it down and ultimately to put it in the tomb. The only empty space in this painting is the space around that ladder. There is no salvation for the Savior here because he's not the Savior as he is thought of in Christian art and Christian thought. He is simply a suffering Jew for whom there is no help. So this is a work that strikes me given its time, place, and circumstances as very much part of Holocaust art, even though Chagall's experience is nothing like any of that that we've up to this point discussed because he is able to get away for the duration and not come back to Europe till the war is over. When the war is over, there will be what we might call post-Holocaust artists to come back to where I began this narrative, survivors who continue to or who start making art to describe what their experience had been, the children of those survivors who feel obliged and impelled to do the same, relatives other than children, nieces, nephews, ultimately grandchildren, Jewish artists in general in particular when we get into the 80s and the 90s, and even in the end really, important German and Austrian artists who were born after the war, who looking back on what was created by way of destruction in the countries from which they came, feel obliged also to address this topic. But that kind of a discussion, Holocaust art after the Holocaust, is a story for another day. Thank you. <laughs>